I can see a fraction of y'all. I trust that you're still there. Uh, it was great to see uh, Keith and Deanne. They looked uh, maybe even better on top of that mountain, but you look really great here too. Glad to have you. Have no idea why you're here. Uh, I mean, that, those English mountains, I never did get to climb. Uh, climb some others, but not there. I'll finish my housekeeping up here. <clears throat> the shepherds asked me, uh, kind of in this season of this church, praying about and talking and proposing women as female shepherds to come and talk about unity. So you can take a deep breath and uh, I'm gonna talk about unity. Uh, the unity we preserve. No, nobody here created unity. If we all got on the same page about everything, we would not be united. We would be Nazis. We would not be united. That's not what unity is. I grew up in the 1950s in the Churches of Christ. <clears throat> we believe we were the true church. We required doctrinal uniformity on all matters including a cappella music, the Lord's Supper every Sunday, and baptism for the remission of sins. And all of that was a test of fellowship, and there were many other issues that were tests of fellowship. We did not understand why all churches did not agree with us. Because the truth is as plain as day. But let's look at that a minute. Actually, I'd like to talk about three umpires for a second. Because this first umpire was umpiring in the Church of Christ that I grew up in. The first umpire says he calls the balls and strikes the way they are. And he never asked for replays, no replays. This is the 2020 dogmatist about all scripture. Now the second ump in our time, the postmodernist, has gone the other way and says, you know what? Unless I call them, they don't exist. Balls and strikes do not exist. That vision of the world says that there's no truth outside you or me. I have my truth, you have your truth. No replays, no need for replays. And see, what I'm talking about a replay, I'm talking about take a deep breath. Breathe in the Holy Spirit, go back and put the verse you've got in, that's controversial inside the true story of the world and see where it comes out and keep on doing it till you're dead. I've done so many replays. I don't agree with what I said last year. I said that at Lake Highlands 20 years ago. There's always replays because I'm a broken man who doesn't see 2020. That's why I think the, the third umpire, the first two umpires have been sent back to school we have sent those umpires back to school. They're in training because they're wrecking churches. The third umpire says, I call them the way I see it, but my eyes are not 2020. I agree with Paul. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, and it's never going to get better. Your cataracts are going to be here until the Lord comes. My cataracts are going to be here. I'm not going to see it 2020. I'm going to have to have the replays. Then we will see as we're now seen. This umpire asked for replays. He asked for prayer all the time. That's what this, script, this church is into. Put, put the verses back in the true story and take another look. 
and the Holy Spirit shows up and illuminates us. The churches of Christ that I grew up in, and believe me, the church of Christ is not the only per- church with a problem here, uh, uh, by the way. I'm not beating them up. A lot of my wonderful friends and loved ones are in churches of Christ right now. But we've had a long conversation together in which people have told me I'm wrong and I've told them I thought they were wrong and now let's keep talking and praying and keep loving each other as we do this. One of the real problems has been that we believe the silence of scripture was to be interpreted as a prohibition of whatever. Ah, watch that. We, we said this was the argument that caused the churches of Christ to say that instrumental music, this, all this up here shouldn't be up here. Mus- these musical instruments. And in 1906, one million people went instrumental and another million people went a cappella. And I'm in school in the 60s. It was a tragedy. But you know what? When I realized this is wrong, I did not leave. Because God's kingdom treasure lives in a cappella churches. Believe it or not. In 1968, I came under conviction that according to the scripture, the gifts of the Spirit had not ceased. My denomination thought I was a heretic, blackball me. I did not leave because God's kingdom treasure is in churches who are scared of the Spirit. I flunked a heresy test at Abilene Christian University in 1972. I was interviewing to be a professor and I flunked. I mean, all these questions and finally the last two. I flunked on instrumental music and gifts of the Holy Spirit. I did not leave. I was being treated as a false teacher. Why didn't I leave? Because God's kingdom treasure lives in failed denominations. In fact, that's the only kind of denominations there are. They're all failed. We haven't lived up to the unity that that passage that you, that, you know, Keats just read. I have believed we were wrong when we restricted the ordaining of shepherds to men and not women since 1974. (laughs) 49 years. I remember where I came to those conclusions. I didn't come to those conclusions by ignoring the Bible. I came to those conclusions by praying and reading the Bible again, by replays. And I'm not telling you that you have to agree with me. I'm saying we're on this journey together and nobody's infallible. And we don't get there by ignoring scripture and saying, well, it really doesn't matter anymore. See, I did not leave because God's kingdom treasure lives in churches who put women on the bench. An elder in 1964 in the Church of Christ Don and I got married in shouted at us, Jesus first, segregation second. Still remember. At Lake Highlands in the late 1980s, an elder in this church said to me, He was glad that there were no people of color in this church. They needed to be with their own kind. I did not leave this church because God's kingdom treasure lives in racist churches. And so, you know, at the background of all this was something that happened way before all this. When I learned about grace of God in 1963, and that Jim Reynolds is a terribly broken human being. He's actually dangerous. Sin is dangerous. And that I've been saved by an amazing grace. And that I don't get here because I see it all right, and I don't get here because I'm righteous because I'm not. And I did not know that until I was 21 years old. 
And the mentor of my whole life really taught me that in a, in a great Bible doctrines course at Abilene Christian. Along the way, Jesus told me, don't respond, don't, don't react. Respond to Jesus. Don't return evil for evil. And see, Jesus told us what he wanted. He wants unity. And when he prayed that prayer in John 17 about all those who will believe on me through their, through their word, he's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles who are coming in who can't possibly see things alike. You get a bunch of people in this room who are born again and alive in the Holy Spirit, and they disagree about just about everything except Jesus. Are they united? Yes. And that is the mystery of this. It defies your rational and my rational comprehension. In Ephesians chapter 3, I think we have it, but it may be... There we go. Ephesians 3, 6 to 10, Paul is talking about the kingdom mystery. He's talking about the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, are members of the one body. And he says everybody, he's basically saying everybody becomes one in Christ and we administer the mystery in local churches. In other words, how I get along with you and you with me is the administration physically, spiritually, with what is in the heavenlies. And if we don't do any administration of this, this is just pie in the sky, baby. And people are leaving the church because nothing's happened in churches. You know, they're as segregated as everybody else. Or they're as, you know, hateful as everybody else. There's got to be an administration where somebody takes the vision and puts it in boots on the ground. That's what local churches are about. And, And Paul says, and Jesus says, then people will see, oh, that's who Jesus is. And, and, and you, you, you know, I can preach all day, man. I can preach all day. But you manifest that, you administer that, and people say, yeah, I see. Now, let me, something else I want you to know. All of the church, there's no church to restore in the New Testament. They're pretty much all messed up, all of them. And Paul has a vision, and Jesus has a vision of unity and of oneness, and Paul gets beat up a lot because of that. For example, in AD 57, on the, on the way to Jerusalem, Paul writes the book of Romans. And in the, book, in the letter to Rome, he's putting boots on the ground. He's writing the Romans in 57 AD, on the way to Jerusalem with a contribution from Gentile churches to Jewish churches because they don't get along. And the Jewish churches think the Gentile churches and are false teachers and that Paul is. So what I'm saying is he is being a minister of oneness and he's got Romans in his head and heart as he's on the way to Jerusalem. And he's brought a collection. The collection is from the Gentile churches, Corinth, Berea, Philippi, Ephesus. And the church, so he, the, the money is about more than money. The money is about unity. The kingdom mystery here is us, is, is me and you becoming us. And that takes, that takes heaven. That's what he's on the way for because the church is very divided. That's what he's about. That's the vision he has. 
The problem with the church in Rome is, is some people think the Leviticus food laws are for today. The problem in Jerusalem is over the, over the law as well, but it's over the fact that you're not circumcising the Gentiles, you're not circumcising, we think you're probably not even circumcising a lot of the Jews. And so what, what is going on here is the disagreements. These are people who all believe in the Bible. These are people who, who all are Christians. <laughs> Christians. And the Jewish food laws, the issue of is that scripture authoritative is a significant issue. Now, how does Paul deal with it? See, this is the issue the church had in the first century is what I'm saying to you. And this, this man who's full of the Holy Spirit, no wonder it took him 17 years from the time he's converted to the time he leaves Antioch to go on his first missionary journey. God had a lot of reprogramming to do in here. He was a terrorist in 31. He was a Jesus freak by 48. And he's bringing everybody together around under Jesus. So in the book of Romans, what does he do in Romans? He puts the entire church. See, sometimes you get in an argument, take a deep breath, put the argument inside the bigger story, and that's what he does in Romans. Great big story. Let's see again. Let's do the replay. Let's understand again. What does all this controversy mean in that church? And so he says, once we see that, we'll know what to do. Because see, when you know what story you're in and your identity in the story, you know what you're to do. So here's, here's I'm going to do the romp through Romans. Number one. By the way, all of, you, all of you are sinners, dead, none are righteous. And there's not anybody here who's better than the other one. You're all just a mess. That's the first thing he says. That kind of deflates, you know, there's a lot of balloons popping in the Roman church. Number two, you've all been declared righteous, redeemed, and reconciled through the mighty act of God in Christ, Romans 3, 24 and 5, 10. Number four, you've all been set right with God by trusting in the faithfulness of God. No other way. Number four, all, all died to sin all now live in Christ. And there aren't any ifs, ands, or buts about this. Chapter six, one and following. That's why baptism signifies this. Number five, there's no condemnation in Christ. And the implication is, would you stop condemning each other? Number six, all have received the spirit of adoption. You are kinfolk. You may pronounce charismatic differently than the person sitting next to you. You've got different skin color, you've got different accents, you've got all kinds of stuff. You are kinfolk. We don't choose our siblings. We think we do, we church shop. Give me a break. If you're ever think about doing church shopping, repent. <laughs> you are the called out. Let's get our place here. Number seven, all are in the same olive tree. That's my summary, that's my summary of 9 to 11. And he goes into all the history of Israel and the Gentiles. And the bottom line is this. You're all in the same tree. <laughs> Whoa, I didn't want to be in the same tree with you. Dang. All. And you know, he says you're all in the olive tree. 
And that, that kind of turns off the Gentiles. They don't like those olive trees. Those are Jewish things. You're all there, grafted in. And you know at the end of that in chapter 1133, he just breaks into praise. It is, it is amazing what he's saying. Oh, the depths and the riches and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments. Why didn't we think of this? Because we are degenerates, but we think we're good. We just need Jesus a little bit to, to kind of, you know, shave off the edges. We submit to God and we give up our opinions in the church. Is what he's saying. And in the church, we become a symphony. Think about a symphony for a minute. A whole bunch of great musicians coming in and submitting themselves to one director. Submitting themselves to the music and getting rid of all their little opinions. See, you cannot play the music of the kingdom by yourself. You think you can? A church of one. Oh, how I love being here with me. You are out of the symphony. The symphony plays music you can't play by yourself because it's the music of love. And we need people in the church who disagree with us. I don't know where I'd be. I'd still be sucking, stuck in 19, whatever it was, 60, legalism. I've had more people say, Jim, take another look at that. Let's have a replay here. I mean, it must have been 5,000 times. Uh, we need each other. I want to sit and listen to how you get to where you get. We're always us. We are never them. On any issue in this church, don't ever say them. You're talking tribalism. Say us. It may sound, uh, you know, politically... It may be intuitively uh, in opposition to the way you feel. Go ahead anyway. We, our feelings have to catch up with what the truth is. We need these beloveds sharing with us. We need long listening, sharpening. We do not need bludgeoning. Let me just say this about the issues in this church or any church. The enemy is not you. And the enemy is not me. I think we know who the enemy is. Number eight, in Christ we though many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. Now man, this is the bottom line of this. Oh my goodness, Jim, we got this huge fight going and now you're saying I belong to the guy and the lady that I disagree with the most? Absolutely. Praise the Lord. We can all laugh, but come on. But the bottom line of all of the big theology, all the great theology, is he gets down here in our business and says, you all belong to each other. And it doesn't really matter if you've never thought that before. I'm telling you now it's true. And I don't care what you feel about it because your feelings are going to have to catch up with the truth. Feelings do not have authority on their own. So chapter 12 is a wonderful conclusion, but he's got some more stuff here to sort of bring his point home. You can see how he's taking these people from this little conversation this disagreement, this church fight they're having, he's putting them in a wider story. And then at the end here, he's telling them what to do. 
And, and let me say something about this. We do not dismember each from the, from the body because we have disagreements about interpretation. There are times, though, where Gan Greens gets into churches and they lose Jesus or they lose the incarnation. There are places in the New Covenant Scriptures where John, like in 2 John, says you can't go on with somebody who denies that God has become flesh. So I'm not saying that truth doesn't matter, but I'm saying it's got to be what I would call gangrene that's destroying the church. Then we dismember for the sake of the body. We all belong to each other. Number nine, do not destroy the work of God over food. He's, he's coming on here. He has said, chapter 12, now 14, do not destroy the work of God over food. Why, Paul? Why not destroy it? Because this is a biblical issue. This food laws thing are in Leviticus. Well, let's take a, let's take a look at that. I got another metaphor I'm running in on you. Every church has baggage, garbage, and treasures. They're in every church. The garbage is our sins. The bags are what we carry the treasures in and the garbage. Paul uses a little different metaphor in 2 Corinthians 4 broken pots, the kingdom presence, notice this, the kingdom presence is the treasure of the church. So the good news I have for you is our interpretations of scripture are not kingdom treasures. They're bags that we carry the truth in. I've had my bags have worn out several times and I've had to get new ones. I carry, you know, another, another uh, metaphor of this is wineskins. Bags wear out, they change. Bags, interpretations of scripture are important because you love scripture, you love God, you wanna hear God. Interpretations are really important, they're valuable. But the treasure is priceless. So be careful. Don't get a don't don't switch these price tags. The bags are valuable, but the kingdom is priceless. He said it again in 2 Corinthians 4. We, we have this treasure in breakable pots. In chapter 15, 7 and 8, he says, welcome one another then just as Christ has accepted you. In other words, he cannot solve the issue. These are sincere people who disagree about all this. And what does he say? He doesn't say, you know what? Just go down the street down there and start a church for Messianic Jews. And you go over here and you start a church for Gentiles. And then some of the rest of you who just don't care, you can do a third church. And then y'all can just, you know, have a whole bunch of little churches that you're really comfortable in. No. Lord, no. That's not what he does. You know what? If he had done that, he wouldn't have so many wounds on his body. People got mad at him because, he, you know, peace is actually controversial. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. And then he goes on to say, he says, this is chapter 15, 7 to 8, but it goes on to say that we welcome each other in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promise to the patriarchs might be confirmed. I told you he was putting them in a big story. He's talking about something that happened 2,000 years before. He's saying, guys, you got more heat and light in this house church. If you welcome each other, you're going to be in praise to God, and you're going to realize, 
the fulfillment of the purposes of God that were articulated to Abraham 2,000 years ago. That is deep. He's going deep in the story to help them with a current controversy. So they get a perspective about how rich this story is and how wonderful things are and that they are not to destroy this. In chapter 15, finally, in verses 25 to 27, he's taking a collection. He says, I'll just, he says, I am taking a collection to Jerusalem in service of the Lord's people. He is going to, this, get this, I, I used to think, uh, I was talking to somebody about preaching Acts, and he said, uh, you know, I don't even think I need to preach uh, Acts 21 to 28, because uh, all it is is about Paul going back to Jerusalem, and he gets arrested, and he ends up in jail, and then it's over. Uh, I don't think so. I want, I want you to understand that a guy with a vision of peace takes a collection to people who hate him to tell them that he loves, that God loves them, and that the Gentile churches love them. And when he gets there, a riot happens. Nobody even knows if they took the money. They have a riot. But you know, there were all kinds of prophets that said, don't go there, don't go there. No. You know why he went there? So we would see it now. I could tell you this story now and tell you that unity is worth suffering for. You know what happens to him is he, he, ends, up, he ends up going there and going, and going the second mile, and he, all he does, he gets arrested and beat up for it and ends up in Rome, and, and then Nero kills him. That's not, you know, he didn't get to retire on a beach somewhere. This, this is the price we pay for unity, we're willing to suffer for it. The money is a sacrament of peace. It's more than just money. So finally here, Romans is not just saying, Jesus died for me. I hear people say that all the time and I say, you know, just keep on talking, would you? Because it is, gee, Romans is saying he died for us. When, he, when Jesus said, I want to teach you all how to pray, he said, pray our Father, us. And the scriptures in Romans and in Ephesians clear, are clear. He died to make, to make the two of us one. If you want to, you know, what I realized is Jim Reynolds had an encounter with Jesus in Dr. Pack's course at Abilene Christian in 1963, person, a personal encounter with Jesus. And then what, I thought, well, that's really great. I can just run around celebrating the Lord all my life and I don't really need to worry about the church. Wrong. What he did was create in me a, a heart for other people. Is that, and what he's saying is, Jim, I saved you by grace. And for the rest of your life, you give it to other people. They don't deserve it any more than you do. And you sure don't. Give it. So that we can now, because Jim, I didn't die for just you. I died for us. And I died to make the two of you us. This is, this is crucial stuff. Um, the peacemaker, you know, I'm, I, I, I've already talked about what happens to him. You can see that Paul has got something really big in his heart, and he doesn't back off. And you know, what's, what's happening in churches, what happened in that church was these people were, were so into the goodness of their bags and their interpretation of the Old Testament, but they were blind to the mystery of oneness. Paul is pastoring the mystery of peace into a war zone, into a bunch of me's. And so 
he literally calls these people the Lord's people twice. In other words, he's, he's talking about the people that are trying to kill him, and he says, they're the Lord's people. Sometimes I hear us talk about people that we disagree with, and we demonize them. They're the Lord's people. Let's talk about women in this church, and I, I'm going to do this quickly. For the last 20 years, and since Keith's been here, but before that for 15 or 20 years, and because of a lot of replays, this church, this church for, has, because it came out of a legalistic tradition, has done a lot of replays. There's been a lot of prayer here, a lot of Bible study, and a lot of embodying change over the 25 years. And one of those issues has been women. You know, a woman preached here around 2000, 23 years ago. Women have been youth pastors, college pastors. Women have shepherded men. Women have lead home churches. I mean, my goodness, where would this church be without the faithful women? You know, the one who's up here, Leslie Berry, epitomizes all of this. These, these folks have ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit humbly, effectively, and faithfully. There would not be a church here without all of the gifts of everybody who's gone before. Starting with Lana Weisenbaker a long time ago. Some of you know her and some not. So what I want to say here at the end, that today I'm talking about the ordination of women to be shepherds. And what I want to tell you is, that's not a great big issue. That's a narrow issue. Because this church has been empowering women for 25 years. Women have the gifts of the Spirit. Women are in leadership here in lots of different ways. Women, you know, there are churches where women can never go to the pulpit. Women never preach. Women never lead anything. So we have a narrow issue here. And we need to understand that and understand our history and what God is calling us to understand as, as we walk through this time. What... When, when, when someone is recognized to be a shepherd in a church, they are ordained. Ordained means they're authorized to serve. When, when somebody is ordained to be a shepherd, we're not birthing something new here. We're recognizing what's already here and been here a long time. And it's been a huge blessing. I mean, when I think of the people who've been leaders in this church for the last 40 years, man, men and women just run through my minds, and I don't think about which gender they're in. I just think, God, without that, I don't know where we'd be. And what's happened is the whole team is getting off the bench into the game. That's what this is about. The whole team off the bench into the game. And so you kind of wonder, where am I going to land? I'm about to land. <laughs> the big question is this. The big question. And it's always this. Are we good enough to do unity? That's the question. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says, I don't want you guys to try to create anything. I just want you to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And I want you to be completely humble, gentle, and patient. So that's what he's calling us to do. And what he says is, this is the life that's worthy of Jesus. 
Just exactly what Keith was saying. Man, it's tough to be the answer, the good answer to the prayer there in John 17. I can't do that in the natural. I do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so what I found is God calls me to do something that I'm not naturally given to do, which was be completely humble, gentle, and patient. Because this is the body of Christ. And I'm not cutting off with anybody. I'm not cutting any hand off. I'm somebody, I got up here and told a bunch of people in this room, a bunch of believers, that you know my, this is an example of this, you know what I think about the church affirming gay marriage. I'm not going to do a, the wedding of two folks who are of the same sex. But you have the right to be here in this church and disagree with Jim about this. And you may not have a shelf to put what I just said on, but it's really important. I wasn't compromising. I was just saying, hey, let's continue the conversation. You are a beloved child of God. You have the Holy Spirit. You love the Scripture, and you disagree with me. And the same to you. You are my beloveds, and you belong here. And I remember one guy that had been arguing with me, and I remember his smile still. He lit up like a Christmas tree. Oh, I can come here and disagree with the preacher. Yeah. Yeah. But you keep chasing Jesus. And let's see what he does with you, what he does with me, and let's see what he does with this church. So I'm out of ammunition. Let's stand up, please. (laughs) And I want to pray for the Holy Spirit to make us good enough for unity. Lord, 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 you you know... uh, Come, Holy Spirit, on us. Manifest your presence. Manifest it in love, humility. We love the truth. We love Jesus. And God, I just just ask that your Holy Spirit does whatever you're, you're wanting to do in this body right here, right now, going forward. And that everybody, wherever, however they look at things, they all belong here. I just thank you for the, 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 the bigness of Jesus. I thank you for how big the life is that you have called us to live. Glory be to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit as you were in the beginning or now and ever will be, world without end. Come, Lord Jesus. And the body said, amen. Amen.